Hey, good morning, kids. Uh, we are reading the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, uh, this is the book called The Horse and His Boy, Chapter 9, Across the Desert. <coughs> Excuse me. How dreadful, how perfectly dreadful, whispered, whimpered, rather, Lassaroline. Oh, darling, I am so frightened. I am shaking all over. Feel me. Come on, said Erebus, who was uh, trembling herself. They've gone back to the new palace. Once we're out of this room, we're safe enough, but it's wasted a terrible time. Get me down to that water gate as quick as you can. Darling, oh, how can you squeak, Les Arlene? I can't do anything, not now, my poor nerves. No, we must just lie still a bit and then go back. Why back, asked Arvis. Oh, you don't understand, you're so unsympathetic, said Les Arlene. Beginning to cry, Erebus decided it was no occasion for mercy. Look here, she said, catching Lasseroline and giving her a good shake. If you say another word about going back, and if you don't start taking me to that water gate at once, do you know what I'll do? I'll rush out into that passage and scream, and then we'll both get caught. But we shall both be k k k killed, said Lasseroline. Didn't you hear th what the Tisrock, may he live forever, said? Yes, and I'd sooner be killed than married to Ahoshta, so come on. Oh, you are so unkind, said Lasseroline, and I in such a state. But in the end, she had to go in, give in to Erebus. She led the way down to the steps that they had already descended and along another corridor, and so finally out into the open air. They were now in the palace garden, which sloped down in terraces to the city wall. The moon shone brightly. One of the drawbacks about adventures is that when you come to the most beautiful places you are often too anxious and hurried to appreciate them. So that Erebus, though she remembered them years later, had only a vague impression of gray lawns, quietly bubbling fountains, and the long black shadow of cypress trees. When they reached the very bottom, and the wall rose frowning above them, Lassaroline was shaking so much that she could not unbolt the gate. Erebus did it. There at last was the river full of reflected moonlight and a little standing stage and a few pleasure boats. Goodbye, said Erebus, and thank you. I'm sorry I've been a pig, but thank you, but think of what I'm flying from. Oh, Erebus, darling, said Lasseroline, won't you change your mind now that you've seen what a very great man Ahoshta is? Great man, said Erebus, a hideous, groveling slave who flatters when he's kicked but treasures it all up and hopes to get his own back by egging on the horrible Tisrock to plot his son's death. Ha! I'd sooner marry my father's scullion than a creature like that. Oh, Erebus, Erebus, how can you say such dreadful things? And about the Tisrock, may he live forever, too. It must be, it must be right if he's going to do it. Goodbye, said Erebus, and I thought your dresses were lovely. I think your house is lovely, too. I'm sure you'll have a lovely life though it wouldn't suit me, closed the door softly behind me. She tore herself away from her friend's affectionate embraces, stepped into a punt, cast off, and a moment later was out in midstream with a huge real moon overhead and a huge reflected moon down, deep down in the river. The air was fresh and cool, and as she drew near the further bank, she heard the hooting of an owl. Ah, oh, that's better, thought Erebus. She had always lived in the country and had hated every minute of her time in Tashba'an. When she stepped ashore and found herself in darkness for the rise of the ground and the trees cut off the moonlight, but she managed to find the same road that Shasta had found and came just as he had done to the end of the grass and the beginning of the sand and looked, like him, to her left and saw the big black tombs. And now at last, brave girl though she was, her heart quailed, supposing the others weren't there, supposing the ghouls were, but she stuck out her chin and a little bit of her tongue too and went straight towards them. But before she had reached them, she saw Bree and Wynne and the groom. You can go back to your mistress now, said Erebus, quite forgetting that he couldn't until the city gates opened next morning. Here is money for your pains. To hear is to obey, said the groom, and at once set off in a remarkable speed for the direction of the city. There was no need to tell him to make haste. He had also been thinking a good deal about ghouls. <laughs> Excuse me. For the next few seconds, Erebus was busy kissing the noses and patting the necks of Wynne and Bree, just as if they were quite ordinary horses. Oh, here comes Shasta. Thanks be to the lions, said Bree. Erebus looked around, and there, right enough, was Shasta, 
who had come out of hiding the moment he saw the groom going away. And now, said Erebus, there's not a moment to lose. And in hasty words, she told him about Rabadash's expedition. Treacherous hound, said Bree, shaking his mane and stamping with his hoof. An attack in time of peace without defiant scent. We will grease his oats for him and we'll be there before he is. Can we, said Erebus, swinging herself into wind saddle? Shasta wished he could mount like that. Brew-hoo, snorted Bree. Up you get, Shasta. Can we? And with a good start, too. He said he was going to start at once, said Erebus. That's how humans talk, said Bree, but you don't get a company of two hundred horse and horsemen watered and victualed and armed and saddled and started all in a minute. Now, what's our direction? Due north? No, said Shasta. I know about that. I've drawn a line. I'll explain later. Bear a bit to your left, both the horse, both you horses. Ah, there it is. Now, said Bree, all th that about galloping for day and night, like, like in stories, can't really be done. It must be walk and trot, but brisk trots and short walks. And whenever we walk, you two humans can slip off and walk too. Now, are you ready? When? Off we go. Narnia and the north. At first, it was delightful. The night had now been going on for so many hours that the sand had almost finished giving back all the sun heat it had received during the day. The air was cool and fresh and clear, and under the moonlight the sand in every direction, and as far as they could see, gleamed as if it were smooth water or a very great silver tray. Except for the noise of breeze and wind's hoofs, there was not a sound to be heard. Shasta would nearly have fallen asleep if he had not had to dismount and walk every now and then. This seemed to last for hours. Then there came a time when there was no longer any moon. They seemed to ride in the dead darkness for hours and hours, and after that there came a moment when Shasta noticed that he could see Bree's neck and head in front of him a little more clearly than before, and slowly, very slowly, he began to notice the vast gray flatness on every side. It looked absolutely dead, like something in a dead world, and Shasta felt quite terribly tired and noticed that he was getting cold and that his lips were dry. And all the time, the squeak of leather, the jingle of the bits, and the noise of the hoofs. Not property, property, as it would have been on a hard road, but thumpity, thumpity on a dry road. At last, after hours of riding, far away on his right, there came a single long streak of paler gray, low down on the horizon. Then a streak of red. It was the morning at last, but without a single bird to sing about it, he was glad of the walking bits now, for he was colder than ever. Then suddenly the sun rose and everything changed in a moment. The gray sand turned yellow and twinkled as if it were strewn with diamonds. On their left, the shadows of Shasta and Wynn and Bree and Erebus enormously long raced beside them. The double peak of Mount Pyre far ahead flashed in the sunlight and Shasta saw they were a little bit out of course. A bit left, a bit left, he sang out. Best of all, when you look back, Tashba'an was already small and remote. The tombs were quite invisible swallowed up in that single jagged edged hump which was the city of the Tisrock. Everyone felt better. But not for long, though Tashba'an looked very far away when they first saw it, it refused to look any farther away as they went on. Shasta gave up looking back at it, for it only gave him the feeling that they were not moving at all. For it only uh, then the light became a nuisance. The glare of the sand made his eyes ache. But he knew he mustn't shut them. He must screw them up and keep on looking ahead at Mount Pyre and shouting out directions. Then came the heat. He noticed it for the first time when he had to dismount and walk. As he slipped down to the sand, the heat from it struck up into his face as if from the opening of an oven door. Next time it was worse, but the third time his bare feet touched the sand, he screamed with pain and got one foot back in the stirrup and the other half over Breeze back before you could have said knife. Sorry, Bree, he gasped. I can't walk. It burns my feet. Of course, panted Bree. Shouldn't have thought of that myself. Stay on. Can't be helped. It's all right for you, said Shasta to Erebus, who was walking beside Wynn. You've got shoes on. Erebus said nothing and looked prim. Let's hope she didn't mean to, but she did. On again, trot and walk and trot. Jingle, jingle, jingle. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Smell of hot horse. Smell of hot self. Blinding glare. Headache and nothing at all different for mile after mile. Tashba'an would never look any further away. The mountains would never look any nearer. He felt this had been going on for always. Jingle, 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 squeak, squeak, squeak. 
smell of hot horse, smell of hot self. Of course, one tried all sorts of games with oneself to try to make the time pass, and of course they were all no good. And one tried very hard not to think of drinks, iced sherbet in a palace in Tashban, clear spring water, tinkling with dark earthy sound, cold smooth milk just creamy enough and not too creamy, and the harder you tried not to think, the more you thought. At last there was something different, a mass of rock sticking up out of the sand about 50 yards long and 30 feet high. It did not cast much shadow, for the sun was now very high, but it cast a little, and into that shade they crowded. There they ate some food and drank a little water. It is not easy giving a horse a drink out of a water bottle, but Bree and Wen were clever with their lips. No one had anything like enough. No one spoke. The horses were flecked with foam, and their breathing was noisy. The children were pale. After a very short rest, they went on again. Same noises, same smells, same glare, till at last their shadows began to fall on their right, and then got longer and longer till they seemed to stretch out on the eastern end of the world. Very slowly the sun grew nearer to the western horizon, and now at last he was down, and thank goodness the merciless glare was gone, though the heat coming up from the sand was still as bad as ever. Four pairs of eyes were looking out eagerly for any sign of the valley that Salopad the raven had spoken about. But mile after mile there was nothing but level sand, and now the day was quite definitely done, and most of the stars were out, and still the horses thundered on, and the children rose and sank in their saddles, miserable with thirst and weariness. Not till the moon had risen did Shasta in strange barking in the strange barking voice of someone whose mouth is perfectly dry, shout out, shout it out. There it is. There is no mistaking it now. Ahead and a little to the right, there was, a, there was at last a slope, a slope downward and hummocks of rocks on each side. The horses were far too tired to speak, but they swung around and toward it, and in a minute or two they were entering the gully. At first it was worse in there than it had been out in the open desert, for there was a breathless stuffiness between the rocky walls and less moonlight. The slope continued steeply downwards, and the rocks on either hand rose to the height of cliffs. And then they began to meet vegetation, prickly cactus-like plants, and coarse grass of the kind that would prick your fingers. And soon the horses were falling on pebbles and stones instead of sand. Round every bend of the valley, and it had many bends, they looked eagerly for water, the horses were nearly at the end of their strength now, and wind, stumbling and panting, was lagging behind Bree. They were almost in despair before at last they came to a little muddiness and a tiny trickle of water through softer and better grass. And then the trickle became a brook, and the brook became a stream with bushes on each side, and the stream became a river, and there came, after more disappointments than I could possibly describe, a moment when Shasta, who had been in a kind of a doze, suddenly realized that Bree had stopped and found himself slipping off and before them a little cataract of water poured into a broad pool and both the horses were already in the pool with their heads down, drinking, drinking, drinking. Oh, said Shasta and plunged in. It was about up to his knees and stooped his head right into the cataract. It was perhaps the loveliest moment of his life. It was about ten minutes later when all four of them, the two children, wet nearly all over, came out and began to notice their surroundings. The moon was now high enough to peep down into the valley. There was soft grass on both sides of the river, and beyond the grass, trees and bushes sloped up to the bases of the cliffs. There must have been some wonderful flowering shrubs hidden in the shadowy undergrowth, for the whole glade was full of the coolest and most delicious smells, and out of the darkest recesses among the trees there came a sound Shasta had never heard before, a nightingale. Everyone was much too tired to speak or to eat. The horses, without waiting to be unsaddled, lay down at once. So did Erebus and Shasta. About ten minutes later, careful wind said, we mustn't go to sleep. We've got to keep ahead of that Rabadash. No, said Bree very slowly, we mustn't, mustn't go to sleep, just a little rest. Shasta knew for a moment that they would all go to sleep if he didn't get up and do something about it, and felt that he ought to, but in fact, he decided he would just get up to persuade them to go on, but presently, not yet, just not yet. Very soon the moon shone, and the nightingale sang over two horses and two humans, all fast asleep. 
It was Erebus who woke first. The sun was already high in the heavens, and the cool morning hours were already wasted. It's my fault, she said to herself furiously. She jumped up and began rousing the others. One wouldn't expect horses to keep away after a day's work like that, even if they can talk. And of course, that boy wouldn't. He's had no decent training, but I ought to have known better. The others were dazed and stupid but the heaviness of, with the heaviness of their sleep. Hey ho, brew hoo, said Bree. Been sleeping in my saddle, eh? I'll never do that again. Most uncomfortable. Oh, come on, come on, said Erebus. We've lost half the morning already. There isn't a moment to spare. Fellow has got to have a mouthful of grass, said Bree. I'm afraid we can't wait, said Erebus. What's the terrible hurry, said Bree? We've crossed the de desert, haven't we? Yeah, but we're not in Arkenland yet, said Erebus, and we've got to keep get there before Ravadash. Oh, we must be miles ahead of him, said Bree. Haven't we been coming a shorter way? Didn't that raven friend of yours say this was a shortcut, Shasta? He didn't say anything about shorters, answered Shasta. He only said it better because you've got a river this way. If the oasis is due north of Tashba'an, then I'm afraid this may be longer. Well, I can't go on without a snack, said Bree. Take my bridle off, Shasta. P -p Please, said Wen very shyly. I feel just like Bree that I can't go on. But when horses and humans with spurs and things on their backs, they are often made to go on when they are feeling like this. And then they can find, I mean, they ought, oughtn't we be able to do even more now that we're free? It's all for Narnia. I think, ma'am, said Bree very crushingly, that I know a little more about campaigns and forced marches and what a horse can stand than you do. To this wind made no answer, being, like most highly bred mares, a very nervous and gentle person who was easily put down. In reality, she was quite right. If Bree had had a tarkin on his back at that moment to make him go on, he would have found that he was good for several hours hard going. One of the worst results of being a slave and being forced to do things is that when there is no one to force you any more, you find that you almost have lost the power of forcing yourself. So they had to wait while Bree had a snack and a drink, and of course Wynne and the children had a snack and a drink too. It must have been nearly eleven in the morning before they finally got going again, and even then Bree took things much more gently than yesterday. It was really Wynne, though she was the weaker and the tired of the two who set the pace. The valley itself, with its brown, cool river, and grass and moss and wild flowers and rhododendrons was such a pleasant place that it made you want to ride slowly.